I was a year too early on the Saints because last year I thought you were high on the Saints last year. Last year yeah, I thought they might win eleven That's or true. twelve games, and they rewarded we, me with schlock. Welcome in to the NFL on Fox podcast. I'm your host, Dave Hellman. And whoa, what a show we've got for you. We already had a good show. So much going on. Had a chance to chat with our friend NFL on Fox insider Jay Glazer about so many things happening in the NFL coming out of week two. We're going to talk about teams that should be panicking, teams that we're buying as contenders. Are they for real? Are they not real? So much to get to. And that was before Monday Night Football provided us with an absolute banger. A relatively sleepy game turns into a classic in the final five, six minutes between the Philadelphia Eagles and the Atlanta Falcons. So tons to get to. Like I said, contenders, not contenders. We're going to talk to Jay Glazer. Got a lot of news from around the league to get to. But without further ado, let's recap a wild Monday nighter to wrap up week two. All right, well, we were going to welcome in Fox Sports' Carmen Vitale anyway to help us recap week two, but given what just played out at Lincoln Financial Field, why (laughs) not bring her in a little early to go through this wild result? The Atlanta Falcons come from behind at the death to take down the Philadelphia Eagles 22-21. Carmen, or like we're recording this right after the game. Yeah, like, I might. feel like I just chugged a Red Bull. I know. I'm 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 amped because that was a Kirk Cousins led Atlanta Falcons team, and Kirk Cousins did not look good for a majority of this game. And then somehow somebody I don't know somebody gave him some smelling salts on the sideline. That last drive was utter perfection Kirk Cousins has looked like a 145 million dollar <laughs> mistake for most of the last two weeks Except like for crunch time on all crunch of time. all of week one and most of this game with the exception of a handful of throws he looked like a 36 year old coming off of an Achilles injury sure couldn't put any zip on the ball couldn't even like like even the play actions weren't working like it looked like he was laboring to move in the backfield the the, yeah the ball didn't get to where it needed to go it was late it was off target he wasn't accurate he was 7 of 13 for 75 yards in the first half on the last drive alone he was 5 for 6 for 70 yards and a touchdown which let's let's set the scene if for some reason you missed this which this is why Even if the game's bad, you just don't turn it off. You leave it on in the background. Look at your phone. Do something else. Like never flip over to the to the movie on cable. No, no. You can do that any night of the week when there's live football on. You never know what's going to happen to set the scene. A sleepy game for the vast majority of this thing. Eagles and Falcons trade scores in the second half. And then late in the fourth quarter, the Philadelphia Eagles go up 18-15. They drive down deep into Falcons territory with under two minutes. On a third down, they've got Saquon Barkley on a on a flare out. He's going to have a shot to extend for the line to gain and end this game, essentially. Falcons burn their timeouts. If Saquon Barkley catches a swing pass, essentially, and puts his shoulder down, the Eagles are going to kneel out this clock on the Falcons' eight-yard line. Yeah. Instead, he drops it. I think he was he was looking to get upfield before he, he secured the ball. He was. He definitely was. Falcons kicked the field goal to go up 21-15. And then, to your Eagles, point, Eagles. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Eagles kicked the field, kick goal, field goal to go up 22-21. And Kirko Chains takes over from there, like looking exactly like the guy the Falcons were hoping he would be when they signed him all the way back. I mean, the deci- like there were so many things that also went wrong for the Eagles on that drive like first of all you go back to the Saquon call and why didn't you just run the ball you'd have so much so much success running Saquon and like you wanted to bleed the clock anyway so just keep it on the ground that was a risk and then on top of that you're playing prevent defense daring Kirk Cousins to throw the ball and then he does I mean he had absolutely zero pressure on him that entire last drive 
and the corners couldn't cover. It was it was the worst of both worlds for the Philadelphia Eagles, and it was an utter collapse again. Which, yes, key word again. Right. Because dating back to last season, this is now the Eagles' fourth blown lead with two or fewer minutes remaining in the game. That's wild. That's absolute. I mean, I know things didn't go well for them last year with Nick Sirianni but it and the coordinator changes to the depth of the of the issue here. That's what I'm saying. Like yeah. now that you have Kellen Moore, you have Vic Fangio, you're supposed to be able to right this ship. And week one, it looked like they did. But week one is a liar. We all know that they were playing on some questionable turf in Brazil, and then you get to week two. You know what happens? What's funny is like, it was almost like this was the Eagles 2023 season just condensed down into one night. One night. Oh my God. You're so right. Because for the first three and a half quarters of this game, like it certainly wasn't the prettiest game of the season. The Eagles only scored 21 points. They struggled in the red zone, but Jalen Hurts rediscovered some of his running mojo in this game. 85 rushing yards. He gets Which was a, only 10 off of Saquon, who led the team. Exactly. Gets his running mojo back. Like, certainly not an amazing night throwing the ball, but it, it was good enough to beat the foul, to, to win this game. I mean, yes. that's what it looked like. They got the brotherly shove going in the second half. Sure did. Picked up a few first downs that way. Uh, and then, can I interject, though, with Jason Kelsey in the booth for the first? Wasn't, wasn't that push? wild? Like, it felt a little too convenient. That the Wild. Eagles start picking up brotherly shoves so, while Jason Kelsey while Jason Kelsey's in the booth is in the Monday night booth talking about it. Regardless, this ju- it felt like last year where you're like, yeah, it's not the prettiest thing in the world, but here they are running the ball and picking up cr- Pick clutch first down. It doesn't have to be pretty. Chauncey Gardner Johnson made one of the coolest plays of week two. Absolutely stuffed Bijan Robinson yeah. on a fourth and short. That comes with about five minutes to play, and that that felt like the dagger to me. Where I was like, okay, the way the Eagles have yeah, been running the ball, yeah, I think we both said we're like, all right, that's probably game, right? They're gonna they're gonna run this clock out. Maybe they'll score a few more points, but this is ball game effectively. Until it wasn't, and it's it's almost inexplicable, just like it was last year. The way the Eagles weren't able to close this out. I think it's a great point about their pass rush. I'm just going to guess a lot of people in Philadelphia are going to be asking questions about Bryce Huff. Ooh. The $50 million acquisition. Who, who didn't do anything. He has really not made an impact through two games no. now to this point in the season. Maybe maybe the Jets and Eagles just want to <laughs> redo that. Just, hey, <laughs> send Bryce. We'll take Bryce Huff back in New York. And Hassan Reddick can come back to Philadelphia. Maybe that's the answer to this. Can I can I tell you the bone I pick or the bone I have to pick with this? Of course, of course. So after Kirk Cousins leads this amazing drive, throws a touchdown to Drake London. Yes, Drake London does a celebration, which I'm not condoning. Does in front of the ref, gets flagged. Thank God, Young Wei Koo is just money, so it doesn't matter. You're right. This game could have gone to overtime. It could have gone to overtime right there because of an excessive celebration penalty. When, in fact, that stop by CJGJ, which, listen, not going to take anything away from that because it was cool AF. But he rips his own helmet off and doesn't get called for it. Yeah, They actually threw the flag and picked it back up because he convinced them that he didn't actually do it on purpose when the replay clearly showed he did it on purpose. I don't care. I'm glad they didn't call it because you should be able to do whatever the hell you want after you stuff a guy like that. But then don't call the penalty on Drake London. Well, if we're having this conversation way back in the, I think, first quarter, Jalen Hurts' first big rushing gain of the night, he spikes the ball ball. and goes, let's effing go. And And then he gets called for They flagged Jalen Hurts for being excited. They Uh, called it a delay of game. Unbelievable Which is insane. Of wimpy. Relax. Very wimpy. Everybody relax. No no fun league. Jeez. What a, I mean, it's crazy to think the the things that change in the final moments of a game like this. We're actually going to talk about this later in the show. We've got a great segment coming up where we talk about 0 and 2 teams and how hard it is to climb out of that hole, 2 and 0 teams, how successful you can be maintaining that momentum. The Eagles were a finger a fingernail away from, from getting to 2 and 0 and the Falcons are a series of fantastic plays by Kirk Cousins from falling into that 0 and 2 hole. Right. None of it happens. 
They're both one and one. Absolutely incredible. Kirk Cousins, his 28th game winning drive since 2015, second most in the NFL over the last decade. <laughs> how about, how, I mean, Mia culpa, I'm guilty of this because it's such a funny joke that 1 p.m. Kirk is better than nighttime Kirk. I've always said that's overblown. It's not well. I'll never say it again. <laughs> Kirk Cousins, 0-9 in his first nine Monday night starts. He's won four out of his last five now. Yeah. The guy, the guy has learned how to put it together in prime time. Maybe none more entertaining. And once again, just never turn the game off. Find, you know, find something to do to occupy your attention if it's not if it's not looking good early. But you never want to miss a moment like the the five or ten minutes we had here with Kirko Chains. No, especially if it's a if it's a one back. score game, like you just you can't do that. You just can't. There's too much parody in the NFL. What a fantastic Monday nighter to cap week two. Speaking of which, as we begin to look toward week three, let's hit some major news items coming out of the weekend. Most of these updates are going to be injury related, but one that is not is perhaps the most shocking. Of the of the week, I would say maybe one of the season, and that's Bryce Young getting benched. Two starts into his second season, eighteen starts into his career. Panthers head coach Dave Canales announced the move on Monday morning after an abysmal twenty six to three loss to the L.A. Chargers. I mean, Bryce Young's play suggests that this is necessary. I don't yeah. think there's any way around that. But when you think of him being a number one overall pick and the Panthers moving heaven and earth to get to the number one spot. Yeah. Even knowing, a lot. even knowing how much he struggled, it, it, it was pretty surprising to see this news come up on my phone. Yeah. From, um, I've actually talked to a couple of people inside that building and what was told to me was basically like, this was a decision by Dave Canales because he realized he was either going to lose the locker room or he was going to have to keep pushing a, pick that people that his locker room didn't believe in and at the risk of losing he rat he didn't want to risk losing the locker room so he figured that this was probably the only course of action uh it was I think it was actually reported by someone else too that this was just like big boy first big boy decision mm. um and it, honestly as a first time head coach to make this call uh obviously it had to run up the chain we all know the kind of owner that David Tepper is he's very involved but it was Dave Canales' choice because he did not want to lose the locker room and felt like they had a better chance with Andy Dalton. I think that is it's something that gets lost when you talk about the human element of of the NFL and of football is there's 60 other guys in that locker room who are working their asses off to right. to win games, to keep their jobs, to all of that good stuff. And the eye in the sky don't lie. Like they can all see the issue at the most important position on the team. I think you can only pedal that for so long before people start to check out and feel like you're just making political decisions. And so that makes perfect sense to me. Bryce young had as many interceptions through two games as the Panthers had scoring drives. Yeah. It hasn't been great. Andy Dalton will take over as the starter for the time being chargers play the Raiders. I don't know. It, it's a bummer. I mean, I, yeah. I understand why it happened. I don't completely blame Bryce Young, but this is a results it is, driven business. It's it's kind of crazy, too, just given the fact that there was really no effort to develop him. And it's such a push and pull. And I mean, it wasn't Dave Canales last year in Carolina, so he couldn't help the fact that Bryce Young had not been developed correctly once he got to the league. And now you get him and you feel like you're already behind the chains, whatever metaphor you want to use, uh, as far as get, be, making it like putting this team together, making it cohesive. And at some point you have to say, all right, I, that wasn't my fault that he's not developed i do think though you pulled the plug a little bit early i mean just the expectations we have on these guys to deliver right away i think it's it was made even harder for bryce young given the fact that the second quarterback taken yeah his his career behind him trajectory is affected by the cj by cj stroud, CJ stroud who is again the exception not the rule 
we will see where it goes from here. I, I don't know. I hope somebody's interested in kicking the tires on Bryce Young. Like, clearly, like I said, the, the change makes sense. I'm not completely ready to give up on the guy. Maybe I should be. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, what is happens. that just you not wanting to be t- entirely wrong? Yes, exactly. 100%. <laughs> this is all about my pride. Hey, let's, that hit some, in the league. let's hit some injury news real quick. Chiefs running back Isaiah Pacheco left uh, Sunday's, uh, the Chiefs' Sunday win against Cincinnati with his foot in a boot. Comes out Monday. It's a fractured fibula. Sounds like Ouch. he's going to miss six to eight weeks from the sounds of it. The Chiefs are talking to. Kareem Hunt wouldn't be surprised to see a reunion there. They also brought Samaje Pirine on after roster cuts over in San Francisco. This one, I just, I always trust that the, the Chiefs are going to figure things out. That's right. what they do. Debo Samuel expected to miss, quote, a few weeks with a calf strain. And all of a sudden, like, look, I'm not saying that the Niners are about to go on a losing streak or anything, but I'm a little. Except that's what happened last year when when Debo fair. Samuel was out. I'm getting a they little They lost three straight games when Debo Samuel was out. Now, Trent Williams was out for a couple of those games, too. So I think that that played a role in it as well. But we also saw Trent Williams do some very un Trent Williams things in Minnesota. Trent Williams looked like a guy who didn't have a training camp against the Vikings. He sure did. On Which Sunday. That shouldn't continue. I fully oh. expect him to figure it out. But this he, does create a blow between Debo Samuel and Christian McCaffrey both being out on this Shanahan offense. I. I I, vibes are not good in San Francisco. The vibes haven't been good in San Francisco all off seasons That's when true. you're talking about guys missing training camp. Yeah, and I guess my point is like I still think of the Niners as a as a contender, as a team that's going to be right great there defense. in the mix. But can't count out Fred Warner. Trent Williams is is working his way back. Yeah. Now Christian McCaffrey is going to be out for a little bit. Debo Samuel as well. Like, sure, the Niners should be fine in the big picture, but right. if you drop one two three games over the next few weeks like that's the type of stuff that makes a difference between being the one seed with a bye and fighting your way through the wild card round so something to keep an eye on in san francisco speaking of receiver injuries quite a few of them the eagles who we just covered almost won this game without aj brown we knew he was going to be out on monday night football but word coming out right before kickoff that he's expected to miss a couple weeks with that hamstring strain for the Eagles. I do think it's interesting. Mm -hmm. The Eagles schedule gets a little, I mean, playing green Bay and Atlanta to open the season isn't exactly easy, but now back-to-back road games against the saints and Buccaneers interested to see how that goes potentially without their number one receiver. Going through most of the NFC South right away. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, just knock. Wow, you're totally right. Knock the whole division out, and then they can play the Panthers in December. Sure. One last thing to take into account, another receiver injury. Cooper Cup also expected to miss an extended period of time with an ankle injury. He is a bad vibes. He's a candidate for IR along with With what feels like half of the Rams. I was going to say also Jonah Jackson now it went down. There's vibes are bad in L.A. too. See how Sean McVay weathers that. I'm guessing it's feeling a lot like 2022 for him, which is not a good thing if you think back to that season. All right, Carm, we will catch up with you in a few. But for now, had a chance to sit down with Jay Glazer on Monday and go over some of his big reactions to all the week two action. All right, back once again for one of our Monday recaps. It's my good friend, NFL on Fox insider, Jay Glazer. Jay, how'd we treat how'd week two treat you, man? Oh, week two was fantastic, man. It was great just being around my football fam. Nothing better. Fox NFL. Center. And by the way, also, this is what a good teammate I am. You see all my Camus on the wall get over here. I, I actually brought in, thanks to my good friend Chuck Wagner, who owns Camus. I brought in a bottle for all my Fox NFL Sunday crew. And I, I, I meant to run up and give you one, but Strahan took like four of them. So I'm sorry about that. Oh, yeah, Michael. I was gonna say, I, I know, you know, you gotta, you gotta get on the elevator. But hey, next time, to him. I'm gonna have to talk to him about yeah. that next time I see him. I kick his ass I, if I were you. You, you know what? I'll, I'll give it a try. Uh, <laughs> all, all pro, defensive end, Hall of Famer. Yeah, I'll give it a try. Uh, re- why notwithstanding, Jay? I, I wanted to catch up with you a little bit. Look. There were 10 games in the early window on Monday. There was a hell of a lot of stuff going on. So I wanted to talk about some teams 
that maybe didn't get as much shine as others. Make sure we hand out the proper amount of flowers. I want to start with the biggest underdog in week two, the Las Vegas Raiders, nine point dogs in Baltimore on Sunday, down by 10 in the fourth quarter. And Antonio Pierce gets his first win in, in, incredible fashion what were your thoughts about that comeback and what the Raiders managed to do by the way you said nine points Antonio Pierce told his team it was 10 points and Ooh. he used that as a rallying for I for his team and you know what look you knew they were going to have an attitude especially on defense right and and you know the big thing about the Raiders was man our quarterback position because quarterback they were hoping in the draft they were hoping to try and trade up at one point they thought maybe they're going to get a guy like Penix and then obviously Atlanta took him so they looked and said okay if we can get our quarterback position to just play decent not hand, not not turn the ball over we know we have attitude on defense that could at least keep us in games maybe win some games but it was more than that Gardner Minshew yesterday was fantastic really placing the ball perfectly where he needed to, especially getting Devontae Adams involved very often. And, you know, even a team like the Raiders where you look at Devontae Adams, there were a lot of teams who looked at them going in the season saying, let's start calling them right now and try and pick the roster because they know they're still rebuilding. They don't have that that quarterback in the future they want to. There's a lot of teams who actually called for Devontae Adams, try and trade for him. And they were like, Dave Telesco, uh, Tom Telesco said, nope, not going to do it. Uh, I've got to give Antonio Pierce a, a chance and really pushed everybody aside for those Devontae Adams, uh, for all those Devontae Adams calls. Wouldn't even, wouldn't even listen to it because I have to give this guy a chance. And obviously, you could see that they were believing in Antonio Pierce. That's I, that's what I was going to say next is like the line on AP is he's a, a culture builder and a guy that gets the locker room to believe. How big do you think that is for the buy-in that they're able to get a result like that this early in the season and kind of, you know, you, sometimes you think see things can snowball on a team to get a win like that. It, it feels like it's got to go a long way toward, toward getting this locker room galvanized behind him. Let me tell you the other thing about Antonio Pierce. I've known AP since he was a player, obviously giants, Washington, all that. Anybody who's been around, talk to his teammates, talk to his coaches. One of the smartest, if not the smartest football player they've ever, they've said they've ever been around. Like I had, there was one coach who said, man, he sees stuff on film that we can't tell the other players because they're not going to see it. Even if we point it out, they wouldn't be able to recognize it. He's that smart. And, you know, even um, when I went to their camp, this training camp, talking to Tom Coughlin, who's there working with them and Marvin Lewis working with them. He's put together an incredible staff of people who really, you know, are trying to help AP along with this process. They too, it's just like, you know, both those guys are like, Smartest dude we've ever been around. He is such a smart, technical player of what he could see, but he's a great motivator also. And you see that guys really want to play and they want to lay it out there for AP. It's a big shot in the arm for a Raiders team yeah. that I think has a, a better overall roster. And they can start believing. Them. That's what they need. Yeah. But again, they need a the quarterback to make sure that he's consistent. You know, he don't have to win for sure. him, but he did go out and do a lot of things for, to win it for them yesterday. Another team out on our side of the country, I guess. Not quite. Phoenix isn't quite the West Coast, but close enough. I mean, goodness gracious. We talked about it on the pod on, on Monday, but what a fantastic yeah. performance from Kyler Murray. Obviously, quells the questions about Marvin Harrison very quickly in that game. But aside from just Marvin Harrison, Kyler Murray, I thought, was just absolutely phenomenal. It really seems like the Arizona Cardinals have him back on track as, as that guy we thought he was when he got drafted. And you know, the interesting part is this is the type of game where teams could look at film and say, we don't know what to do. Like, you know, there are several times the Rams had him and he just, there's no game plan for her. Oh my gosh. Just, you know, he's just, man, it, it was, it was, uh, you know, he's like, he was wearing Vaseline all day long. <laughs> like they couldn't do anything. So it's like, it's not like there was something you look at in the game plan. Okay, we can do this and this and this. Like they had them several times. And then you, when you extend plays that long, their plays are going off for like eight, nine, 10 seconds. When you extend it that long and you have a receiver like Marvin Harrison, there's not a lot to do. You know, but the other interesting thing was I know the Rams going into the game, they knew and they believed that the Cardinals were going to try and get the ball to Marvin early. So they're doing whatever they could to make sure that didn't happen. And they still got the ball to Marvin big time in the first half. So it, it was, you know, I, I, in top, on top of just Kyler and, and Marvin, they also have an attitude. 
You know, it's not just like, hey, we're this finesse team who's just going to get you big. They got an attitude. They got, they got some punch in them over there. I, I thought about that during the game yesterday. I feel like for as productive as he's been during his time in Arizona, James Conner just perennially flies under the radar. Just a very forgotten but very good guy. player. He's 122 survived. yards yesterday. You know, he's a perfect example, though, is of to be proud of your scars. I mean, James Conner's been through a lot in life, right? He's yep. already had a life and death situation. And, you know, I always say, like, the term unbreakable is something that should have broken you and didn't. And as a result, you come through the other side of that tunnel stronger forever. And then you use that. That's your equity in life. Things that you've overcome, that's your equity in life. If you don't let it beat you up, it, it can empower you. And that's certainly what's happened with James Conner. I mean, this guy has taken his life experiences and he's used it for everything else in life. And, you know, he just keeps getting better and better and better. When other guys start aging about this time, he hasn't. He's just gotten better. And he's using those, he's using his scars as a superpower. So many reasons. I, I, I tell people this all the time. I just feel like I have a soft spot for the Cardinals. I have no tie to that city, to that team at all, but I just really enjoy their story. You know, it felt like people really enjoyed bagging on them for a couple yeah. of years, and and they're the ones laughing right now. They look really, really fun. I tell, I, so I just find out of Scottsdale or uh, Tempe in like, oh, five or six or something, and then move back there two years ago to go be with my old fight team, team again. I just miss those guys. I loved it. And the thing about Arizona, um, those fans, man, they, I, I know it's a, there's a lot of stuff going on in that town, but if you're a Cardinals fan, man, they do live and die for you over there. And they, they, when the Cardinals are going hot, man, they absolutely love it. And it feels like, it feels like a rolling party. So Scottsdale is a phenomenal town and it, their, their head coach too, Jonathan Gatt has really done a great job. Like I said, not just having like the Cardinals used to be kind of a finesse place, but they're a tough team, man. They're taking on his personality. The vibes in Scottsdale are definitely going to be worth checking in on if the Cardinals can keep yeah. this thing going. It's going to be fun to watch. Maybe the vibes aren't so good in Chicago after two games. I mean, the Bears are only one and one after losing to uh, the Houston Texans on Sunday night. But through two games, this Caleb Williams experience, I don't think has been what anybody thought they were going to get right out of the gate. How much should Bears fans be worried about what they've seen so far? How do you see Caleb coming along through his first two games? Well, I think part of the problem is the guy that he faced last night. And what I mean by that is everybody's wanting to be C.J. Stroud. And normally rookies don't come to the NFL and play like that. It takes a while. He's going to have growing pains. And look, we're, we're Chicago is going to have – really going to have to take a step forward now is the Texans game. Everybody, here's the game plan. We're going to blitz him and blitz him and blitz him and <clears> – <throat> Caleb didn't have a lot of three-step drop and go. He didn't have a lot of let's just go. Like, you know, he held on to the ball an awful lot. When that pressure was coming, he was still looking to try to make things happen. And he has so much confidence in his arm, that can get him in trouble. So they're going to have to do a lot of things until he starts getting comfortable to get that ball out of his hand and, you know, make sure he doesn't put himself in harm's way. They also have got to do a better job of running the ball, which they've not been able to do. And that's not, you know, the Bears' identity. The Bears' identity is run the ball, run the ball. I do think they have a, a – they put together a really good team personnel-wise, but I do think they've got to do a better job of putting Caleb in safer positions and not let him just sit back there and try to win the game with, hey, I'm just going to look this off and look this off and look this off and try to make a play down there because that doesn't work early on. So they've got to get him confidence by just, you know, completing some easy passes – but quick passes and make sure he's protected because, man, he got beat up last night. Seven sacks and 11 hits on the quarterback. I mean, that's not sustainable for anybody, no. let alone a rookie. No. I just think whether it's, yeah, whether it's getting the ball out faster, whether it's getting him outside the pocket no. on design plays a little bit more, I just, you got to do something to not let edge rushers tee off on him in the pocket mm -hmm. the way we saw from Will Anderson and, and Daniil Hunter. Because honestly, yeah. Even by NFL standards, that was scary in the yeah, second half on Sunday night. But also, again, you saw a lot of times he dropped back and it looked like he was about to throw, and then he just held it and looked for something yeah. else. And, you know, the, the, checking down to different things. But just if he is going to protect himself, he's going to either have to drop back and just throw, get rid of the ball or check it down. Or just they have to work on that, just quick drops and quick throws and timing throws to just get it out of his hand. But more than anything, they've got to get that ground game going.
it's a bit of a down note, unfortunately, but I want to wrap up uh, with Tua Tungavailoa. Obviously, it's it's been a few days since he exited that game against Buffalo with a concussion. I, I don't even like to speculate too much. It's such a delicate situation with where he is. And, and, you know, Mike McDaniel was pleading not to worry too much about football until he's in a good place from a health standpoint. Have you heard anything? What What is the update on where things stand with Tua right now? First of all, they're signing Snoop Pungley from the Ravens uh, practice. That's ball. noteworthy. Uh, so they're going to sign him to back up Skyler Thompson. Okay. Um, the thing about Tua is everybody wants an answer now. Right. We shouldn't. We're not him. Give him some grace. Right. He is meeting with specialists. He's meeting with doctors. So he could get a better understanding of what damage is done in this hit. What's the cumulative effect of the concussions that he's had so far as well. But this is his decision. This is not our decision. It's his decision. There's football decision. There's a life decision, but it's just his decision to make. And everybody wants an answer immediately. And this isn't an immediacy type thing. This is something that he should be given the grace to make the decision that he wants to make for him and his family and his health and his career, not our decision to make. And all of us who are trying to impose our opinions on somebody else, I, I, I don't think, I think that's not being sensitive to him. And I know people are doing it because they care. I get that. Totally get that. But it is his decision and only his decision to make. Let him get information. Let him make the decision on his timeline, not what our timeline is, on his timeline. Whatever that timeline is, that's the correct timeline. To his timeline is the correct timeline. I love that point. And, and Mike McDaniel said something similar. Like, I'm, I am I, I will respect the decision that he comes to. It's a very personal one. I, I think like only the player and, and his loved ones can truly make the informed, the most informed decision. But I really, I hope people can avoid timelines you know right. like it feels it feels icky to be like oh is it, it could no. it be two weeks could it be four weeks no. i don't care how long it takes him i'll respect the decision i i just hope he takes his his no. you know he's very intentional and and takes his time coming up with this decision look even when i was on, on fox yesterday you know i give a little two update but at one point um we discussed you know do i bring up his contract and i said no i i just i don't think that's really um, because it is so sensitive. And I did yeah. want to be, and, and so did everybody at Fox, really sensitive to the human side of this, because in the end, that's what counts the most. I completely agree. We'll see where that goes. Like I said, just take your time to, uh, yeah. I, 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 I don't really want to hear anything about when he comes back to the field. Let's just figure this out, get the best information possible. Jay, when that time does come, I'm sure we'll have uh, some update from you as well as everything else going on in the league. I really enjoy these chats, man. Thanks again you for too, the man. time. Appreciate you. I, I, I'll make sure Strahan gives you his cameras next time. I'll Yeah, let's talk to Michael <laughs> next week about that for sure. Appreciate right, it. See you, man. Thanks as always to Jay Glazer for hopping on with us. And while I've got the Chicago Bears on the brain, Carm, mm. can't help but notice that you're sitting with me wearing your Mike Ditka sweater. I am. You Shout out a, Abercrombie. Had a chance. Well done. Had a chance to watch that. Uh, I, I said it on the on the Monday show, like a, a pretty brutal watch across the board. Houston not doing a lot in the second half of that game against the Bears either. But obviously, uh, Chicago is incensed with <laughs> another slow start by their young quarterback. I know. A lot of narratives for right or for wrong about how similar Caleb Williams looks to Justin Fields earlier in his Bears tenure. Where do you where do you stand on how upset, how nervous we should be about what this Bears offense looks like so far? I mean, I stand where I've been standing in the offseason. There's too much new on this team, and he is still a rookie quarterback. I did not expect this to look good right away. Much to the chagrin of every Bears fan I talked to who insisted that the situation was too good for it not to start out fast. But at the end of the day, the Bears put a lot on Caleb Williams. If you watch him during the game, getting to the line, making different checks, audibling to different things, changing the protections, he has a lot on his plate. And quite frankly, he does not know enough to have that much on his plate. So things looked very discombobulated. There were a ton of miscommunications on offense. 
But the good news is, is I think that as this team gets more used to playing together, as Caleb Williams gets more experience and sees more things from NFL defenses, he's going to get better. This whole unit is going to gel. We saw him in real time. I think you even tweeted this last night. We saw him in real time figure out what he could and could not get away with in the NFL. Mm -hmm. He's scrambling around and trying to avoid sacks and play the hero ball that got him some insane plays in college. And then he figured out, oh, that's Will Anderson and Daniil Hunter. I can't do that now. And it resulted in a sack at one point. It resulted in an interception at another. These are all growing pains that Caleb Williams is just going to have to go through and the rest of his offense along with it. Yeah, it was wild to see the 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 one escape. That was the one I tweeted about where the guy ripped his undershirt yep. and he spins out. I think it was it was either Daniel Hunter or Will Anderson. I don't remember who. After two years of watching him do that in college, really three if you include OU. Right. I was conditioned. I was like, okay, he broke contain. He's gonna spin around and this is about to be a 30 yard gain, if not a touchdown. Right. And it was intercepted, right. I believe, by Kamari Lasseter. Uh, just a a real welcome to the NFL moment where you're like, oh, these guys will follow the play. They will stick with their man. They will stick to their assignments, and it's yeah. not going to be that easy for you. No, the one thing I was a little bit uh, concerned by is the fact that there were so many miscommunications along the offensive line, which is a unit that is supposed to have some continuity, right? You have Coleman Shelton is the only new one on that line at center, and then outside of that, these guys have been playing together and it have significant snaps together. It's in a new system, and I get that, but the pass protection wasn't there. Caleb held the ball a little too long. The play calling, I don't think, helped him out enough when it comes to giving him some quick out options, you know, get that quick game going. And good Lord, get a run game going for this guy because that is a huge help for a young quarterback, if you can lean on the offensive backfield, and that's not something that he's been able to do through two games. I will do you this credit and admit it's easy to get wrapped up in the skill players, and that offensive line's got to be right, man, or it doesn't usually matter unless you really have... They did not look like they knew no. what the other was doing. They did not know. Like It just it looked so incredibly disorganized. It sure did. I do think the schedule is going to lighten up here for the Bears a little bit. Yeah. I'm not I'm not worried yet. And it, it is no. important to remember growing pains are a part of this. But like I said on Sunday, imagine the angst in the Chicagoland area if Will Levis doesn't throw Tyreek Stevenson a gift <laughs> of an interception at the end of that week one game against the Titans. We might be in full-blown panic mode now. We're going to leave the Bears out of panic mode because they did manage to get one, one win. One win because least, of the defense. We really hey, need to be hey, talking it more about it. doesn't matter. They, they got it. No, that's what They I'm got saying. it, and that's what matters. That's what I'm saying is we need to be giving more credence to the oh. fact that this defense is might be the best defense in the NFL right now. They have been playing lights out, and they are the reason we are not panicked about the Chicago Bears. But that's what we wanted to focus on in this part of the show is – whether or not we are panicked about some teams that have started 0-2 because sure. it's easy to say you're not worried. It's easy to say that it's a long season, but the numbers don't lie, Carm. Mm. Going back to the merger, about a 10 11% chance of making the postseason if you start 0-2. Yeah. Only 15 0-2 teams over the last 20 years have managed to make the postseason. So less than one per year, and as you see right here, We've got quite a few of them that started 0-2. So I just wanted to go through with you. We're going to call it the panic meter. Okay. As we try to determine just how worried we should be about these 0-2 teams and whether their seasons truly are sunk after just a couple weeks. We're going to start with last year's one seed in the AFC, the Baltimore Ravens, who found a way to give away that game to the Las Vegas Raiders on Sunday afternoon. Just yeah. how worried... Should we be about Lamar Jackson and the Ravens? Yeah, you called it earlier in the uh, in the preseason and the offseason. Thank you so much for saying that. We should be very concerned about this offensive line. They had multiple departures this offseason, but you also thought that, all right, it's Lamar Jackson. It's Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry didn't always have the best lines in Tennessee, and he was able to be effective anyway. 
What I don't understand is, and maybe it's a product of the fact they don't trust the line, why aren't you getting Lamar Jackson more involved in the run game? I was thinking that, hey, you now have this two-headed monster of Derrick Henry and Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson is your quarterback. Making a defense account for both of those runners on top of the quarterback, like, that to me seems something that's something that's so unique that most defenses aren't really built to defend it. So why aren't we seeing that? I don't know if it's because Lamar doesn't want to run. I don't know if it's because, again, they don't trust the offensive line. I don't know if that's just not part of the scheme. They think Derrick Henry can just handle everything, which he's shown us he can do. But teams are figuring them out pretty quickly. I mean, they went into the fourth quarter yesterday or on Sunday against the Raiders with a significant lead and squandered it. So on a scale of one to ten, where right. are you at? Uh, all that said, those things are fixable, so I'm at three. Oh. Yeah. That's actually lower than I thought. And I, I'm not. I know. I'm I did not. a good job building that up. But I also think, I mean, they yeah, had a phenomenal you just, defense. You had me sold that it was like an eight out of ten just now. No, I know. But also then you have to take into account the whole team. And the defense looks great, even without Patrick Queen. Uh, despite the fact that they did kind of let up in the fourth quarter there. I can't think that that's going to continue under a Harbaugh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'm not, I'm not totally, I'm really not totally worried about the Ravens. I just think that they need to kind of find their identity a little bit more now that Derrick Henry has been added to this offense. And I think they will. I trust Todd Munkin to do that. I'm at a solid four. And you, I mean, you kind of laid out my case. And I've been saying, you're right, I've been saying this all offseason. I thought it was weird. We undersold how much they lost on the offensive line. I don't know that the Ravens have juice in the passing game beyond Zay Flowers, like a guy that truly worries the opposing defense. Like Isaiah likely has had some, I, he's had some nice moments, but. Except when you're trying to ask him to block Max Crosby one-on-one. -on -one, that is a phenomenal point. happened multiple times in that game. Lamar Jackson finished with 45 rushing yards in this game. Half of that came on that Hail Mary scramble, whatever the hell you want to call it, the yeah. very last play of the game. I think that's an interesting point, and it's something the Ravens are probably going to run into along with the Philadelphia Eagles where you're constantly trying to find the balance between your quarterback being a valuable runner and your quarterback also being worth a hell of a lot of well, money. That's and how point. much do you want to subject him to the risk that goes with that. I trust the Ravens to figure it out on talent alone. MVP quarterback, Derrick Henry's still there. But I don't think this team is as good as the one last year, and it's bearing that out so far. Plenty of time for them to get it right, but I'm a little bit worried. Let's keep right. it pushing. Two 0-2 teams in the AFC North, yeah. and they are the two that nobody saw coming. No. Because the Cincinnati Bengals also still with a donut in their win column. Scale of 1 to 10. How worried are you about the Cincinnati Bengals? I'm still not. They went into Arrowhead and went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Chiefs and lost basically because of a defensive pass interference call. Which was a defensive Which pass interference Which it was. It call, was. I'm, I'm, I'm not here to dispute that. It absolutely was. He got there early. He knocked the helmet of the receiver. Like, like You can't do that. Sorry, but you can't do that. They also do not have T. Higgins right now. And T. Higgins is kind of the key to unlocking this entire offense. If you think about the fact that Jamar Chase was doubled a lot. I think you used the term on Twitter, bracketed to hell. Uh, and I'm and that was the case. And so you saw Joe Burrow turn to his tight ends. His leading receiver it was Mike Kosicki, who had 91 yards, 91 receiving yards. And it was a really good kind of make good on the fact that you couldn't really get the ball to Jamar. But guess what adding T. Higgins does to this? Gives another threat to the defense that you can't pay that much attention to Jamar anymore. You can't get away with that because one of those guys is going to make you pay for it. So as soon as T. Higgins comes back, I think the Bengals are going to be just fine. Uh, it's not as if they, again, got blown out by the Chiefs. And, and Joey did, like he always does against the Chiefs, he did really well. It was it was just one of those things where the margin for error in a in a game like that is so incredibly small, but they're going to be fine in the long run. So you're at a one out I'm of at a ten. One. Yeah, I'm glad that you validated me because I I'll say this I'm at a one. I've seen all I need to see from the Bengals. 
Yeah. How silly does that sound when that... they're 0 and 2? <laughs> I've seen all I need to see from the Cincinnati Bengals. They also have Bengals. done this a lot. <laughs> yes, this is what they do. They are one of the 0 and 2 teams that has made the playoffs in recent years. They started 0 and 2 in 2022. They rallied. They got all the way back to the AFC Championship game. I'm not willing to say that. Right. But I saw what I need to see from the Bengals. Joe Burrow looked more like himself. He looked confident navigating the pocket. He got different receivers involved besides Jamar Chase. The defense made life incredibly difficult on Patrick, on Patrick Mahomes. Mahomes. It's one of his worst games as a pro. Yeah. And, I mean, I, I the irony's not lost on me that Mahomes still guided the Chiefs to a game-winning field goal in one of his worst games as a pro. But the defense looks good again. Can Joe Burrow looks good. shine for Trey Hendrickson? Trey uh, Thank you so much because yeah. Bengals fans, I'm sorry I forgot to mention that in the recap show. Trey Hendrickson damn near won this game for you by himself. Between the pressure he got, the sacks he got, and then the penalties he drew. He is, maybe he's not as good as Miles Garrett or TJ Watt, maybe, but yeah. like Trey Hendrickson deserves more love for being in that top tier category yes. with your, your Garrett, your Watt, your Parsons, your Bosa, Max, yeah. your Crosby. Hendrickson is like, he's right there. He maybe is. he's like a half step below. He I doesn't know I would go that far. I think fine, he is right there. Fine with me. He doesn't get the love that he no. deserves outside of the city of Cincinnati. He damn near won this game on his own. You factor in the part where T. Higgins will eventually be back. Yeah. The Bengals are going to be fine. I hate to be counting future wins and losses guy, <laughs> but the Bengals get the Commanders and the Panthers up next. They I know get to play a fourth place schedule yeah, this dude. season. I'm I'm really, yeah. I'm really not worried no. about the Cincinnati Bengals. All right. A lot of reason for optimism there in Cincinnati. Let's take it to a Maybe a little bit harder situation to feel good about. That's the New York Giants, Carm. They fall to 0 and 2 <sighs> against the Washington Commanders. They couldn't kick because they literally lost their kicker to injury during pregame warmups. They probably win this game if they have a functioning kicker yeah. on their roster, yeah. and they don't. They dropped to 0 and 2. They got crushed by Minnesota in week one. Where do you stand with the New York Giants from 1 to 10? Yeah, I'm at a 10. <laughs> Are you kidding? That's yeah, kind of a setup, yeah. This this looks awful because Daniel Jones did not play poorly. He only took one sack. You have Malik Neighbors going over 100 yards again. And you can't get it done? You can't score more than 18 points? What's what's going on here? Defense didn't allow a touchdown. The defense did not allow a touchdown. And you can't win this game, a division game, Pretty with a team that you're very familiar with, especially if you're Daniel Jones. Mm. I mean, you even had Devin Singletary, who had almost 100 yards on his own on the ground. Like, what are we doing here? If you can't get that done in that situation, I don't, I don't know what to tell you, Giants fans. I'm so sorry. Can I zig where you just zagged? Of course. I'm at a one on the New York Giants. <laughs> Is it because you've given up? <laughs> yes. Ouch. I am at a one with the New York Giants because I'm I'm checked out. And I want to be clear. I'm not saying the Giants are going to go 0-17. Of course, like it's a long season. We remember uh the Tommy DeVito saga of 2023. <laughs> like, of course, the Giants are going to win some games. But like in terms of being a team I need to take seriously, I'm out on the Giants. Like Daniel Jones looks not broken, I would say, like not the guy, particularly against stronger competition. Yeah. This is a woeful Washington roster, by the way. Like it's not oh yeah good. The kicker fiasco is like if the Giants were a better team, this would be such a shocking storyline where your kicker has an injury he's nursing going into the game. You don't do anything to back that up and he gets hurt in pregame warmups, and you lose the game because of it, if anybody had expectations for the Giants, Joe Shane and Brian Dable, the decision makers in New York, would be dealing with a circus right Brian now. Brian Dable lost his ever-loving you-know-what on the sideline multiple times. Brian and Dable's getting questions about his job security after game two. Right. That's that's where when, we're at. Again, statistically, I know, yes, Daniel Jones looks lost. I, I want to clarify, because I said earlier, like, he played well. He played fine no he like he, no average he, he was solid in this game but like they when were you, three for three in the red zone when you factor it in with the vikings no, game for and, sure and here's the other thing carm this is a big part of why i'm checked out on the giants his salary is guaranteed for injury right 
So at some point, I know, that's going to make things very interesting down the stretch. If the Giants, Russell Wilson, if the Giants play a few more bad games. How much longer do you risk owing Daniel Jones the rest of his contract because he got hurt in a lost season? I really think we're we're nearing the end of this era. I think it'll be within the next month or so of the season where the Giants say it's not worth it to our bottom line and our future yeah. to keep playing Daniel Jones. Even if he's even if he's not bad, I still think that's the case. And so with the Giants, if he's not your if, you, if he's not your guy of the future, then exactly, yeah, and I'm they, just, I, it's pretty clear that he's not. I am at peace with where the New York Giants are, which is to say, they're just not a good football team, nor <laughs> one that I need to be worried about in the big, big picture. Tough scene for Giants fans. Let's wrap it up with the most frustrating team <laughs> ever, and that would be the Jacksonville Jaguars, who. Once again, just struggle to get anything going. They lose 18-13 to the Cleveland Browns. It's the what feels like the fourth year in a row I've been high on the Jags. It's not over yet, but 0-2 is a hell of a hole to dig out of. How do you feel about Jacksonville on a scale of 1 to 10? Where yeah. are we, we panicking? Yeah, I'm at about a 7, a really solid 7, if not a that little feels, bit more. That feels right. For, again, kind of the same reasoning about the Giants where, again, Trevor Lawrence didn't play bad. I mean, he didn't have a touchdown. He was just very mid. But, like, you have BTJ going for almost 100 yards, so you feel like you probably found a good one in your in the draft. They didn't have really – I mean, they didn't really have much of a run game. Travis Etienne had 52. That, there's that your, is the, – The, the Jags, offense is not well-rounded. The Jags' offensive line is it, – it, it is such an issue that I think it'll – it'll sink the rest of what they're trying to do. Yeah, that's fair. Trevor Lawrence has had some really good moments. He's made some really incredible throws. Like, that's what he does. He makes four or five, like, wow plays a game. Right. But the overall consistency is mind-numbing. When you talk about the blocking, when you talk about the run game, you just have receivers fall down when they're not supposed yeah. to or Trevor make a boneheaded play when he's not supposed to. I'm at a I'm at a seven as well because this just feels like a can't get right type of team. Right. I because I don't really. I mean, you mentioned the offensive line, but like outside of that, like what's exactly what's fixable here? The the receivers and Trevor getting more on the same page than they have been. Yeah, I would guess. I guess I just I. But again, you don't have a well rounded offense either. I mean, I guess the run game is probably your biggest area where if you improve that then I feel a little bit better about it but also on a very unquantifiable level does Trevor strike you as a guy that's like really really like willing his team down the field I'm I'm, I, I'm asking I can't go that far I do I think people call me a Trevor apologist and I'll just own it I think he has that potential like he's got the arm he's got the athletic ability you know he had a huge scramble in this game to get the ball down near the goal line and like I said he'll uncork two or three like whoa throws right. in a game but you also have to take that with turnovers or an untimely safety that takes a field goal out of play in this game four sacks to like, four sacks every time which you should expect when you're playing the Cleveland Browns. every time I have a reason to feel good about the Jags they do like three atrocious things and so yeah, I'm I'm at a seven because it just, it feels like too much to overcome, especially when you play in the AFC. Like yeah. you know, you you talk about having the schedule lighten up. Like it's a lot less likely when yes. you play a schedule like that. I just I don't know. Maybe they dig out of zero and two, but like, does that help them attain playoff status? I start yeah. to have my doubts when they do this time and time and time again. Agreed. Can you tell I'm very frustrated with the Jacksonville Jaguars? I, yeah, I can. But, I mean, I think Jags fans should be very <laughs> frustrated, especially because this isn't even your division anymore either. Oof, sad but true. All right, but enough of the doom and gloom because there's plenty to be excited about heading into week three. Plenty of 2-0 and o teams, Carm. Mm -hmm. And now we're tasked with figuring out which ones we believe in and which ones we don't. For all the, you know, the well-earned angst about 0-2 teams, like I said, 10-11% of 0-2 teams make the playoffs, 2-0 is a great place to be. <laughs> it is far less of an indicator of reaching the postseason than you might think. Oh. 
64% chance. 64% okay. of teams that start 2-0 and make the playoffs. It's a good number, but not a great number. Sure. I looked this up. In the last five years, multiple 2-0 and teams have missed the playoffs four times. So 2022, every 2-0 and team wound up making the playoffs that year. But in 2023, 2021, 2020, 2019, you had at least two that started off this well, missed the postseason. Do you remember that the Atlanta Falcons and Washington Commanders were 2-0 and last mm, year? Just not really, to be honest. <laughs> there. Just to offer you some perspective. So it's exciting. It's not a given of anything. So okay. let's go through some of these 2-0 and teams and decide if we think they are real or not real. Okay. And we'll lead this thing off with the Pittsburgh Steelers. We got a big road win against the Denver Broncos. Officially, maybe the most forgettable game of week two. <laughs> but, hey, this defense is legit. You think they're real or not real? I, not real. I, And it depends, I guess, on what you mean by real or, or not real. Like, ah, I, no, no, no. That's, the, that's a good question. It is because do I think that they still have a shot to make the playoffs? Of course I do. They've never had a losing season under Mike Tomlin. They've always been this defense first, run first team. And that continued, but they scored one offensive touchdown in the first two weeks of the season. That puts them in company with the Chicago Bears, among other teams. The only difference really between the Steelers and the Bears right now is a couple of turnovers. Right, Caleb Williams had a couple of interceptions. Justin Fields did not. But you have to think that those are going to come at some point. Also, the Steelers are helping out their quarterback a ton more right now than the Chicago Bears are. Not to mention Justin Fields isn't a rookie. So you have a, a decent enough run game. you got a defense that is suffocating opponents, so you don't even have to score that many points. But that has to catch up to them at some point. And even if they do make the playoffs, I don't expect them to be actual contenders. Yeah, I think that's the perfect way to put it. And I, I'm with you. I, I don't think the Steelers are for real. I think they're not real. But that's mainly about the standard that you hold a team like Pittsburgh to. You yeah. Know? Six Super Bowl trophies. Like, yeah, Pittsburgh Steelers are absolutely good enough to have a winning record and sneak into the playoffs because that's what they've been doing. And I'll go as far as to say this. T.J. Watt, Alex Highsmith, Cam Hayward, Minka Fitzpatrick, Patrick Queen. That makes them worth watching alone oh for sure i can't wait to tune in every week and see how their defense beats the hell out of who they're playing but do i see the steelers being substantially better than the additions we've seen here over the last three years no no i do not so if if being a wild card is good enough for you i guess you could call them real real right but this is the pittsburgh steelers and by that standard i'm saying not real i think that's fair can i interest you in a conversation about the New Orleans Saints, who Ooh. put my Dallas Cowboys. I was going to say, the better question is blast. can I interest you in a conversation about right. the New Orleans Saints, Mr. New Orleans native slash Dallas Cowboys writer for 10 years? Life is always hell when the Saints play the Cowboys because I'm, <laughs> I'm catching it from somebody no matter what. It's but true. Let me, let me offer, even at this early stage in the season, I will offer up an apology to the New Orleans Saints because I think they're for real. Okay. I think they're for real. And look, it's my job to do a power rankings. I had the Saints down at 28th heading into the year because mm -hmm. I didn't think they did enough to fix their offensive line. Yep. I don't trust Derek Carr when he doesn't have good protection. Yep. I watched Fair. this team be one of the most unwatchable offenses in the league for a lot of last year and just struggle to a completely forgettable season. Yeah. I had low hopes based on the fact that the team looked very similar. Maybe I didn't give enough credit to hiring Clint Kubiak and bringing some modernity into the Saints offense because, thank you, it's the same group. And, whoa, do they look a lot better. <laughs> whoa, are they on an incredible pace. I mean, yeah. they're not going to score 40 points every week. But, again, you have to consider context. Like, they play in the NFC South, an infinitely winnable division. Yeah. The schedule looks much more forgiving than it does for a team like the Pittsburgh Steelers. I was a year too early on the Saints because last year I thought you were high on the Saints last year. Last year yeah, I thought they might win eleven or twelve games, and they rewarded we, me with schlock. 
<laughs> and this year, I was prepared for more of the same, and they look like a team that could be a threat to be a good seed in the NFC playoffs. I really don't think it's too early to say that. What say you? No, I agree with you. I also think they're for real, which is wild because I didn't think that was going to be coming out of my mouth this season. Me neither. Trevor Penning looks like a new man, their left tackle. And speaking of new men. So right does, tackle. Right tackle. Right tackle. I'm sorry. Uh, and speaking of new men. Derek Carr looks like a new man, too. He had the second best EPA per play of any quarterback in week two. He's slinging it. All of a sudden now, I think we went into this season thinking that the Atlanta Falcons and the Buccaneers were the, the, were the, the best teams in the NFC South. I'm here to tell you I think that it's the New Orleans Saints and still the Buccaneers. Can we just can, can you just indulge me for like three seconds to give a little bit of shine to the Buccaneers because they are also one of these two and O teams. I mean, this is a this is a pro Bucks podcast. It is a pro Bucks podcast, and this is a more specifically pro Todd Bowles podcast because, good lord, going into Ford Field for a divisional round rematch with the Detroit Lions, who are favored in the NFC, especially in in the NFC North dismantling them with the amount of injuries that you had on defense, not to mention Vita Vea goes down during the game. This was a masterclass by Todd Bowles in trying to figure out the personnel you have to work with and what is going to work best against a very formidable opponent. I want to share one thing with you about a text I got from a Lions assistant coach who out of the blue just texted me to tell me that that defense is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read it right now. That defense is physical and disciplined. Players' pursuit to the ball was crazy. He called, he meaning Todd, called some perfect plays at times, was the epitome of players executing scheme and playing hard. That was potentially two of the best defensive play callers in the league going against each other in Aaron Glenn in Detroit and Todd Bowles. And the Bucks. I am here to tell you are we, we're not doing them on this segment, but they are for real. They've been for real, and we need to talk about them more. Are you are you happy to inject inject your Bucks propaganda into this? Saints it's not propaganda when it's true. Moment. That's fair. I just it, it's very funny that for several years when when Tom Brady was there and Drew Brees was winding down his career, that was this division. It was Saints and Bucks, and right. they and had some. I think it's still Saints. That and Bucks. we're back. We're back, baby. We took like one year off, <laughs> and now it feels like it's gonna be. New Orleans and Tampa again. And I really don't think I'm getting ahead of myself. Like the Saints defense has always been like that. How like, is Demario Davis still doing this? How are question. any of them still doing and it? And Cam Jordan. Cam Jordan. Tyron Matthew, too. Tyron Matthew's still doing it. They're Tyron all still doing it. They didn't even have Marshawn Lattimore against the Cowboys, and it did not matter. No. We know the defense will hold up its end of the deal. It's not realistic to think that their offense can keep doing this every single week. Right. But if it even approaches this on a regular basis, the Saints are bare minimum a nine-win team and yeah. maybe several more wins than that. So very, very for real in New Orleans. I'm sorry, Saints. I was not familiar with your game. <laughs> All right, let's keep it pushing back to the AFC. Let's talk about... I would say the 2-0 and team that I bet the fewest number of people in the country have seen, that would be the Los Angeles Chargers. Know, right? They beat the Raiders in week one by two scores. They drubbed the Carolina right. Panthers in week two. I'm going to say not real just because that is an inconclusive data set, in my opinion. Yeah, so, I mean, we we saw what the Raiders were able to do against the Ravens, but that was not the game that they played against the Chargers. No, it was not. And I also feel... Like, teams aren't currently built to defend this Jim Harbaugh smash mouth football offense, which is why I thought that they would have more success, why I thought J.K. Dobbins could have a breakout year. So far, he looks phenomenal. But eventually, teams are going to wise up. And eventually, you're going to have to throw the ball. And are you confident in your scheme that it can be that multiple at this point? And I don't know that I am. And again, it's just an inconclusive sample set at this point. I don't take anything away from a team playing the Carolina Panthers at this point who just benched Bryce Young, their first overall pick. It just, it, I, I can't, I can't in good conscience do that. Can I share a fun stat with you? Of course. Prior to this season, Justin Herbert had thrown for less than 200 yards in seven starts. Okay. He was two and five in those games. Okay. He's 2-0 and oh doing that so far so this far season. After Jim Harbaugh. Ground and pound, baby. We're not worried about airing it out. We're going to ground and pound and play good defense. 
I think like the, the formations were just hysterical. I'm like, am I watching football back in the nineties at this exactly. point? I'm I'm happy that the Chargers look like a competent team and I'm I'm buying the long term vision for LA so hard. I just think they're a year away. Like I think yeah. they'll they'll have a nice season. And similar to the Steelers, like if the best case scenario is a wild card team, how much further are they going? Also, but I need I division. need to see a yeah, and they share a division with, with the, Chiefs, the Chiefs, obviously. And now the Raiders, who I don't know, we're gonna see. They're I'm like, not. I'm. I'm just not willing to buy this yet, in large part due to who they've played. But I'll tell you what, at Steelers and Chiefs up next for the Chargers. <laughs> so Jim, we're gonna Har- find out real quick. He's got a chance to feed me some serious crow. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. We'll wrap it up with a team that's also near and dear to your heart. Yeah. A a statement win, if ever there was one. The Minnesota Vikings beat the. I, I know it was only a six point game. They beat the brakes off. San I was Francisco. gonna say it was not. It was not. That they game. they were they all were over the game. place in a big win against San Francisco. Are they for real or not for real? They are real. They are exactly who I thought they were going to be. They are going to be a good team. People were not giving enough credit to Kevin O'Connell, their head coach, and their entire offensive staff. Also, you and I. Sam Darnold truthers, can we stand up? Can we go yes. on a little bit of a victory lap here where up. coaching matters? This is the best situation that Sam Darnold has ever been in. And he has clearly thrived under Kevin O'Connell with Justin Jefferson. With like we don't even have TJ Hawkinson yet back to this offense. And True. they are still, you've got Aaron Jones, Jordan Addison is fighting through certain if we're fighting through injury. But the thing is. I trust this team to be good. How good? I don't expect them to win the NFC North. And I said it all offseason where I was like, this is not going to be an easy win over the Minnesota Vikings. They they may be a 7-8-9 win team. It's going to take a lot to win the NFC North, so I don't think that's ultimately going to matter. But in a season where there were no expectations of the Vikings and nobody's job is on the line, this is best case scenario. And I think it's absolutely sustainable because, oh, by the way, I didn't even get to Brian Flores' defense. I can I can read defenses when I watch tape. No, not this one. <laughs> I can't read Brian Flores' defense. Yeah, Neither can pretty much anybody playing them. They are so good at disguising coverages and disguising blitz packages and disguising everything that they're doing to the point where they also don't have real tendencies that you can key in on. Andrew Van Ginkle added to this defense. He was with Brian Flores in Miami. But you now have two bookends in Dallas Turner, one of their first-round picks, and you have Jonathan Grenard on the other side, who you got from the Houston Texans, who was a double-digit sack guy the year before. You have the bookends taken care of. Now you can just do some real fun, you know what, with Andrew Van Ginkle. You're just like bring, say it. They're doing some fun some shit. Fun shit. They're doing some Andrew fun Van, shit up there. They're doing some fun shit with Andrew Van Ginkle in particular, and also just I mean those linebackers. You saw what Blake Cashman was able to do. It this defense, the pre, the blitzes that happened last year, where Brian Flores just brought the house all of the time, didn't always result in pressures. He is now not even blitzing as much as he was last season. I think he's blitzing about half the amount, but getting more pressure because you have four guys up front when you're in your nickel package that can just wreak havoc on opposing offensive lines. It's so fun to watch, and it's going to make this Vikings team very feisty. So they're the, fun. the Vikings are very real. Yeah. And lo- like, what was the offseason line about this team is basically for everything you just laid out, Flores' defense is just a, a nightmare. Like, just a strange team to play. They're going to get after you. We, I can list off all the skill players and the guys that they'll get back. We said all offseason, if Sam Darnold's, like, decent, this is a pretty good team. That's all he well, needs to be. His passer ratings through two weeks, 113 and 109. He is top 10, if not top 5, in most major passing metrics right now. He's two weeks. looked really good. Kevin O'Connell... I think is rapidly climbing the list of NFL coaches in terms of guys that I want certainly overseeing Welcome. my quarterback. Welcome. It feels, I've been singing his praises for two years. It feels really good to be here. I mean, what he did with a slew of backups last year That's what was I'm saying. impressive in its own right. And I think Sam Darnold, is, I mean, of course he's technically a backup, but he's a, 
much better backup than what I mean, the you Vikings paid $10 million to get it. Exactly. So. Exactly. And on top of that, maybe my criteria is not exactly fair. It's a little bit easier for me to write off AFC teams, the Chargers and the Steelers, where it's like, well, yeah, you've got to figure out a way past Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, Joe Burrow, CJ Stroud. The NFC is so much more wide open and no, oh, by the way, the Vikings just beat the best overall team in the NFC when all of their players were healthy. For the eighth straight time in the Metrodome or U.S. Bank Stadium, the San Francisco 49ers have not won in Minneapolis in 32 years. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. <laughs> I don't know if they can keep streaks like that going, but I'll take this Vikings formula against a lot of teams. I think they are for real. I think they are especially, and again, the NFC North suddenly looking a little more, I'm not going to say wide open, but a little more open. I mean, if Jordan if Love o- is out right now, Caleb Williams and the Bears are figuring things out. The Detroit Lions at least proved that they are mortal. Yeah, with but a, I mean, also, a game they should have The won Packers didn't Tampa. lose that game with Malik Willis at quarterback no, because if Kevin O'Connell is in the running for coach of the year, my, Matt LaFleur might be too. We're not <laughs> worried about that. We're You're trying to take shine away. You're trying to take I'm shine not. away. Minnesota Vikings, very for real. Of course, we feel good about the Packers as well. I'm just saying the division feels a little more open than it did before we started playing these games. That's what's going to make so. it so fun to follow. That was fun. It was. One last bit of business before we wrap the show. You know the drill. It's time for the power rankings. Week two is over. Week three is beginning. So let's sort it all out, decide who's better than who, and get angry about it. It's what we do here. It's the point of this whole thing, isn't it? All right. Without further ado, show me my week three 2024 power rankings. As we like to do, let's start it down. We'll start it down close-ish to the bottom. I think I think the bottom third of the league is pretty static for the most part. But let's start with a team we've mentioned a couple times on the show, all the way down at number 21. I am sorry to the LA Rams, but I had to drop you 12 spots The Rams and Dolphins both taking significant drops because of injuries. And in terms of the Rams, instead of losing their quarterback, the Rams seem to have lost literally everyone else. We talked about Cooper Cup going down, a potential IR candidate. That puts him on a long, long list of injured players. That includes Puka Nakua, offensive tackle Joe Noteboom, offensive guard Steve Avila, offensive guard Jonah Jackson, Cornerback, Darius Williams, safety, John Johnson, the third. Did I get everybody? Actually, no, I didn't. Those are just the major names dealing with injuries. You saw what the Rams looked like without all of these guys against Arizona. It was really bad, and there's no reason to be optimistic that it'll get better in the short term. I'm honestly really sad about it. I think the Rams, healthy, are a very fun, good team. We saw what they looked like against the Lions in week one, but I don't know how anybody weathers this many injuries at one time all the way up at 14 their division rivals the Seattle Seahawks move up three spots to number 14 the resume is not overly impressive they got by Denver in close fashion in week one it took them till overtime to beat the New England Patriots on Sunday I don't know though I the defense is feisty Geno Smith is playing good football right now like very quietly one of the better quarterbacks of week two I just I kind of like what the Seahawks are all about I'm not ready to make any grand proclamations but steadily moving them up through the first two weeks of the season I like what I've seen in Mike McDonald's first couple of weeks on the job just above the Seahawks I've got the Green Bay Packers I gave the Packers a substantial drop heading into week two because they lost their quarterback. I'm sorry. I need to see you succeed without your starter to believe it. Lo and behold, the Green Bay Packers did it. I've got them up three spots to number 11. Malik Willis was good enough to go in and get a win against the Indianapolis Colts. I'm still not completely sold. There's still going to be a few more weeks till Jordan Love is available if I had to guess. I need to see a little bit more from Malik Willis, but just winning one game can do wonders for keeping the Packers afloat until Jordan Love is ready to play again. I've got him just outside the top 10 with the opportunity to make a big jump, particularly when Jordan Love returns inside the top 10. I think I did it earlier in the show already, but I'll just say one more time to any Saints fans listening. 
I'm sorry, guys. Here you go. Here's a ranking that reflects what you've done. I had the Saints way down in the mid 20s at the beginning of the season. They're up 12 spots to number nine after crushing the Dallas Cowboys. Are they going to keep up this pace every week of the season, 40 points a game? I doubt it. But Clint Kubiak has got the play action working with this offense. He's got the running game going. And if the Saints offense is clicking like that, their defense is more than good enough. I'm absolutely taking them seriously as a threat to win the NFC South through two weeks. And then up at five, again, I think the top of the league largely staying static. A lot of contenders honestly lost in week two. But one team that notched a very impressive win, it happened early, but don't forget about the Buffalo Bills up two spots and into the top five. They deal with injuries. They lose guys in free agency in the offseason. They lost linebacker Terrell Bernard in the middle of that game against the Dolphins, and they just don't care. They're just going to go out and beat you with, with a brick for three hours. That's what the Buffalo Bills do, and I think it's awesome. I think their defense is going to find a way to get it done. Josh Allen has been playing incredible through two weeks. And even if this is less star power than we're used to from the Bills, I am sold. They are the real deal. I got them in my top five. That does it for the week three power rankings. Feel free to leave a comment on YouTube. Holler at me on social to tell me how wrong I am, how I wronged your magnificent squad. And I'll see if I can address those as we move into week four. That does it for the show. A really fun one, jam-packed, such an amazing week, too, and we will be back to do it all again so soon. Make sure you're following us on the socials at NFL on Fox Pod. Go subscribe to the show if you haven't. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your pods. We'll be back on Thursday to preview week three, and, of course, we will have you covered all through the weekend, all season long, as we march toward Super Bowl 59 in New Orleans. As always, I appreciate it so much. Thanks, y'all. I'll talk to you soon.